let me start by just introducing myself for those of you I haven't met. Uh, so my name is Sam, uh, Sam Fanshaw. Uh, on this call as well is my colleague Mary Gadams, who is also the founder of the company uh, and the, the inspiration behind us all being here at all. And Mary is going to monitor the chat in this group. Um, so you can talk to each other or talk to Mary in the chat if you have burning questions or comments, uh, as there are a number of people here who um, have done the race before and have also done a number of our other races. Uh, and all of your comments are, are um, going to be interesting and get going with this uh, short presentation. Very little of what I'm going to say here uh, is different to what we've uh, communicated before so far. Um, but I wanted to make sure it was clear, go over the key points, and then also give you a chance to ask your questions, both to me and to the group. Um, so let's start with what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to talk about how to get to San Pedro briefly, the requirements to enter Chile, mainly for the COVID-19 uh, related items. Uh, we're going to talk about the meeting time and place, a little bit about San Pedro, the pre-race schedule, the COVID-19 race protocols for the race, and then I'm going to talk briefly about the course and equipment with some summaries and tips, uh, go over some frequently asked questions that I get asked, and finally, a chance for, for you to all ask um, your questions to myself and also to other people on the call. So let's start with getting to San Pedro. Hopefully you've all booked your flights already. Um, but just to be clear, if you haven't, the most common route is, first of all, you fly into the capital city, which is San Pedro, um, sorry, the capital city, which is Santiago. Uh, and then you take a domestic flight uh, from Santiago to Calama, which is about two hours. There's 10 flights a day and they fly from early in the morning till uh, later at night. And the main airlines are LATAM and Sky Airlines, and they also are some on JetSmart. We recommend, I would certainly recommend, that you go directly from Calama Airport to San Pedro de Atacama. Calama is not a very exciting town, but it does have um, amenities if you were to need a big supermarket uh, or to source any other equipment. That's the only real reason to go to Calama, and the airport is on the San Pedro side of Calama. Uh, there's also shuttles that go directly from Calama Airport to San Pedro de Atacama. They take about an hour, uh, and it would be the same if you were wanted to take a private taxi. They cost 13,000 Chilean pesos each way, which is about 15 to 20 US dollars. Um, they would prefer payment either in local cash or it, by credit card, but they may take either US dollars or euros uh, if you have no other option. Um, they'll take you to a requested hotel, so directly from the airport, and they'll drop people around um, to the hotels, including you to your hotel. I highly recommend that you book it in advance, although it may be possible to. Um, to get a ride in one if there was space when you arrive. When you arrive, they should have, if it pre-booked, they should have a plaque with your name on so you know where to go. Um, and if not with your name, then for the transfer company. Uh, and if you don't see that, then there are some, um, some counters uh, which they have very close to where you come, come out um, having picked up your bags. Uh, each shuttle, there's a picture of, of uh, one of the shuttle buses here, and most of them are the same, take about 15 people. And the one I've recommended to most of you is Transfer Pampa. There are some others. Uh, De Modades is not recommended, but they still take the same route. They're just not as reliable. I've had some situations to not be as reliable. Um, it's also possible to take a taxi. There may be some taxis um, waiting. There won't be many. So if everyone wanted a taxi, it wouldn't be possible. Um, but for those who want, I will send the details of how you can book one in advance. And that would be about um, 40,000 Chilean pesos or 50 US dollars per car. Couple of uh, traveling tips. Um, so you need to carry your, not, you don't need to, 
I highly, highly recommend and request that you carry as much of your race gear as possible as hand luggage, so you don't check it in um, to the flight. It's our experience at all races that um, at least one, if not a handful of check-in bags are lost. And that just causes a lot of extra stress to run around trying to get your bag back, find out where it is, get it to San Pedro, uh, or in some cases where it can't get there on time to have to source, beg or borrow the equipment. So please, please carry as much of your race gear as possible as hand luggage, uh, wear your shoes, even wear your jacket if you need to, but obviously your multiple tool or knife needs to be checked in, otherwise that will be confiscated. Uh, keep food and powders in its original packaging until after you've arrived in Chile. And Chilean Customs has some quite strict rules about fresh food. Um, they may allow some in if it's fully packaged or vacuum sealed, um, but generally they don't like things like uh, fruit, vegetables, cheese, um, even dried meats. Uh, you can try to bring it in um, or look to purchase it. Most of it could be purchased in um, San Pedro de Atacama itself. We've never had uh, problems getting freeze dried meals or electrolytes or powders through in terms of their, their food restrictions. So there shouldn't be any problems, but of course, anything um, can change. If you do have problems with your baggage or your food um, being taken from you or not getting there, then let me know um, when, once you've arrived in the country. Also try to do everything you can at the airport when you know about that to see if there's any way that you can get your bag or your uh, food or any other issues you've had resolved directly with the airline whilst you're there on site. Um, bring hard copies of your vaccination certificates and also your uh, insurance, which covers for COVID-19, which I'll talk about in a moment, because it's likely you're going to be asked for those um, at Chilean immigration in Santiago and possibly also your domestic flight. And maybe your vaccination certificate at various other times whilst you're in, in Chile. And then just in the way of trying to uh, reduce the chance of uh, anybody arriving at the race, uh, having having come into contact with with um, somebody who has COVID-19, please wear masks at the airports on planes uh, and also in the next couple of weeks, just be careful and, and vigilant about how you're mixing with other people. Um, so requirements to enter Chile. <clears throat> so this has changed um, in the last week. The latest update is that you no longer need a mobility pass uh, in order to um, either enter Chile or to travel domestically in Chile. You also no longer need the, to fill in the affidavit form or the declaration before you board your flight. Uh, and for some time now, if you're fully vaccinated, you've not needed a PCR test. You do, however, need your vaccination certificates uh, insurance that covers for COVID-19 of at least 30,000 US dollars, and of course your passport as normal. What they've said is from the 1st of September that your proof of vaccination together with an identity document will, will uh, be valid as your mobility pass. However, as these rules have changed quite recently, it will be interesting to see if all of the airlines in all of the countries that you're coming from have are fully aware of the changes. So I feel like it's possible that an airline before you board may ask you to fill out um, the, the affidavit um, declaration. And just to be on the safe side, it's worth keeping that link close by on your phone or, or written down so that if you were needed to fill that in before you flew, you've got a chance to easily do that. Um, and the same, if you have a mobility pass, which I know a lot of you already have applied for it, then bring it because that will, will help and make things easier along the way. And then uh, generally in terms of visas, most countries don't need a visa to enter um, Chile. And I think for those that do, I've been in touch with you. So Europeans, um, UK citizens, American citizens, uh, Japanese citizens do not need a visa. Um, but if you come from another country where you often need a visa or you're not 100% sure, please check. And if you need any documents from me, let me know. 
And finally, what the Chilean government is also saying at the moment is they may do random COVID testing when you arrive um, at the airport. Whether how much that they do and how, what the chances are of you being chosen, actually, I, I'm not sure. So we'll find that out on the day. But just don't be surprised if you are asked for that. OK, the meeting place and time. So everyone needs to be in San Pedro de Atacama by Friday, the 23rd of September and you can arrive at any time. On that, that evening, we have a room reserved in your name at the race hotel, which for most races is the Hotel Diego del Magro, uh, and check-in there is from 3 p.m. Some of you I've been in touch with separately, you've requested single rooms uh, and paid the supplement, so you will have a single room there. For everyone else, uh, you will be in a shared room with another racer. Um, and for a few of you, you'll be at the staff hotel, which is about 10 minutes walk down the road. Uh, and I will have been in touch with you if that's the case. Our first official meeting, um, regardless of, of where you're staying, is on Saturday, the 24th of September at 10 a.m. at the race hotel around the pool. And a couple of photos here of the hotel, the race hotel. It's very centrally located. It's quite a big property. It's got quite a lot of space. It's still very simple, but it's clean and, and nice. So this gives you an idea of what you can expect. And this photo here is the actual entrance that you drive through when you arrive. So to, to clarify or to confirm, um, you need to be at the Hotel Diego de Almagro on Friday, the 23rd of September at any time. And our first official meeting is on Saturday, the 24th of September at 10 a.m. A little bit for you about San Pedro de Atacama. So it's a very small desert oasis town. You can walk across it or across most of it in about 20 minutes. And if you keep walking beyond that, then you'll find yourself in the desert. Um, so it'll, it's a great place and easy to be able to acclimatise uh, and be out of the, the town, uh, but equally you can access everything very easily. Its permanent population is around 5,000 people, but that grows significantly with the um, international visitors that go there. It has dusty street, single storey buildings. Here's a photo of the high street here, um, again, to give you an idea of what, what to expect. It's very nice, but it's very simple. It has nice restaurants and cafes. It has um, quite a lot of small supermarkets, but no big um, commercial supermarkets. There's a couple of ATMs and money exchanges. Um, most places do accept international credit cards. Uh, and there are a couple of shops where you can buy outdoor gear. The North Face has a shop there, and then there's a couple of others, but they're expensive and they have a very limited range. Some tips for San Pedro. So there is a couple of there are a couple of ATMs in San Pedro, but they often run out of money or run out of service. So if you feel like you need some some local cash and you're just arriving the day before, um, then it's better to go to an ATM in Santiago or Calama Airport on your way. Um, I said supermarkets, you can buy all simple things, crisps, noodles, um, water soft drinks, cheese, hams, um, nuts, dried fruits, but nothing fancy and not a huge selection of anything. Also fresh fruits, it has a fresh fruit market as well. Um, but don't arrive there expecting to buy all of your um, all of your food other than your freeze dried meals for the week. Try to bring um, as much as possible with you. Uh, that doesn't classify as fresh food or with the hope that you can get it through customs. Um, the Wi-Fi strength and availability in San Pedro varies from hotel to hotel, from location to location, and from uh, depending on the time in the day. Um, so just be ready for that. Um, buy bottled water to drink. You can drink from the taps, but generally it's not recommended if you're coming um, from overseas. And then just some of our favorite restaurants um, in case you're looking for somewhere to eat. The hotel will have breakfast provided. For the night that we're providing and if you're staying there before 
Um, it does have a restaurant for the evening, but I would recommend that you just walk up the road five minutes to the um, to the main street in San Pedro and, and try one of the different restaurants, which are very good. So Adobe, La Estaca, Intisol, La Casona. There's a little bakery at the edge of town called La Franchuteria um, or Tocana, which is where we'll have our awards banquet afterwards as well. So race schedule, I am repeating myself a bit here, but it's just important to know. So Friday, 23rd of September, arrive to the race hotel, check in and relax, nothing else to do uh, that night and check-in time is 3 p.m. Saturday, the 24th of September is when everything starts. So plan to have any extra things that you have to do, whether it's sightseeing or shopping or, um, or anything else um, done before Saturday. So we'll have a Pre-race briefing at 10 a.m. around the pool in, in outside in, around the pool in um, Hotel Diego de Almagro. At 11 a.m. we'll do the race check-in by tent and I'll be sending you in the coming week um, your, your tent assignments. And for those who are in single tents, then there'll be an assignment of time for you as well. At approximately 3 p.m. we'll board buses to go to Camp 1 and we will have arrived at Camp 1 by 5 p.m. And that evening, all you have to do is find your tent, relax, have dinner. You need to take um, a dinner to uh, Camp One uh, and then um, and then just rest, try and get some sleep, enjoy being in the desert, nothing else to do there. On that day, breakfast is provided at the hotel. Checkout time is 12 noon and you can leave one bag in reception for um, storing. Storing for the week, which will then get back to you after the race. And then on Sunday, the 25th of September, um, there'll be hot water available from 5.30 in the morning and the race starts at 8 a.m. Protocols for COVID-19. Now, unfortunately, COVID-19 is still out there. Thankfully, um, all participants in the race will be vaccinated and with the vaccination seems to have come um, no longer making it a, a, a critical, critically dangerous disease if you get it. However, we still want to try and keep it out of camp because a bit like a bad flu or bad cold, it's not great for, for running long distances if you have um, COVID-19 or, or any other um, disease like that. So we're no longer requiring you to take a PCR test after arriving in Chile, but we are asking you to bring three rapid COVID tests from home with you. If you can't bring them from home, you can purchase them in Chile, uh, but they are difficult to find in San Pedro. So it's better if you can bring these from home. And then we will ask you to complete a test on Saturday morning before the briefing and show the results to our staff uh, at the race check-in. The briefing and check-in is all outdoors. Um, we probably won't be requiring you to wear a mask there, but if you want to, before we know that everyone has at least a negative um, rapid test, then of course we, we will, uh, we agree to you doing that. And actually we, we recommend that you do that. During the race, if you have any symptoms, um, COVID-19 symptoms, whether it's coughing, um, I'm gonna say other things like headaches or being tired, which can be other causes. But if you do, then we will isolate you at camp uh, and we will ask you to, to take another rapid test. If it is pos positive, we will then be discussing with the medical director about whether it's safe for you to continue racing. Uh, but if you do, you will be kept separate, not, not completely separate, but in a separate tent and away from, from the rest of the races. We're asking you still to bring nine masks and we will require you to wear them in confined situations, um, which includes on the bus, uh, in the cyber tent, uh, in the medical tent, and if you're ever in, in, a, in a close group of people, we recommend that you wear your mask. I'm asking you to be extra vigilant in the coming weeks and during your travel to San Pedro. Um, no big parties, big gather well. Try to avoid or be sensible if, but so you have, you're not put in, in situations where you could um, come into contact with somebody who has COVID-19. And then we're requesting you to sleep with the tent doors open. Uh, the tents are closed tents, um, but there is a one that you can open so it has the mesh um, open, which will allow for ventilation to come in. Um, and that's the reason why we are 
allowing you to bring an extra sleeping bag that we will carry for you. Now I move on to the course. Now, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because hopefully you've read my previous emails and this information um, is all on the website. Um, checking the distance of each stage uh, and also the elevation of each stage. Quickly to, uh, to summarize on how a day will go. So for almost every day is going to be the same from Sunday morning uh, and then most days after that. Hot water will be available for preparing your meals and drinks in the morning from around 5.30. At 7.30 a.m. we'll have a morning briefing and at 8 a.m. the race will start. If this changes, we will let you know in advance. If it changes, it will be due to obstacles on the course or weather conditions that require us to, um, to start later. For example, if it was to be um, foggy, then we want to make sure that you can see the flags. Um, everybody starts together on most days. There's a checkpoint every 10 kilometers or six miles where there you can replenish your water. There will be a doctor at most checkpoints and there'll be volunteer staff and shade um, where you can have a rest or discuss any concerns. The leaders are expected to finish um, the 40 kilometer or 25 mile stages in under four hours. So they'll be finished by 12 noon. And the last people are expected to finish in 10 to 11 hours, so you'll be done by 6 or 7 p.m. Again, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but here's the elevation chart as a reminder. Uh, and it's all on the website, on the Atacama Crossing website under the course page. Um, but to see how the elevation looks. This is not a steep downhill, but it is all downhill. However, it may not feel like it because you're still up there at altitude. But these little pops are definitely worth noting uh, in advance. We'll be giving you the detailed course notes um, at race check-in uh, in San Pedro, and then you'll keep those with you for the week so you can refer to each day and it will show the distance of each section, the elevation gain and loss for each section, uh, and, and a very um, just an outline of the terrain or what you can expect to see um, on the course. There is a presentation that's on YouTube that I did. It was a Zoom information session specifically about the Atacama Crossing course that if you haven't watched it already, I recommend you watch. And I'll send a follow up to this email, uh, sorry, to this, this information session with the, a link to this recording and also some other resources that I mentioned here, which will include a link to this um, previous info session I did. So I went through each stage, stage by stage, showing the elevation of that stage and pictures of what you can expect to see. Uh, I'm showing you some of it here to give you an idea. So on stage two, the slot canyons that people talk about a lot. Um, and to answer your question now, will you get your feet wet? Well, you can see from the photos here that yes, you will. Um, before checkpoint one, you definitely will get your feet wet. Um, on stage two, again, another example, just showing you. So there's a big climb going up and you can see here photos of what the climb looks like. It's a long, steady climb um, for a few kilometers going uphill. OK, stage three, I'm, again, I'm not going through details. I just want to show you some photos and it will hopefully bring your imagination to life to life and encourage you to go and watch the um, previous info session that I did. But there are some photos from stage three. It's debatably the hardest stage, but of course, everyone has a different opinion. Um, the reason I think it's hardest is it's where the sections of the salt flats start. Uh, it also has a lot of up and down. You can see some of the dunes here. They're not big dunes, uh, but people are on their hands and knees. Um, and then it, it has no shade um, throughout most of that stage at all. Stage four, the infamous salt flats, giving you an idea of what they look like. The salt flats definitely aren't flat. You can see a little bit of the terrain there. Um, but again, watch the info session to see more. Stage five goes through Valley of the Moon. And you saw on the elevation chart, I just showed you that there's a big blip in the middle. And here's the, the uh, hill that you'll be climbing um, about 30 plus kilometers um, into, the, into the race, about 20 plus miles into the, into the stage.
Now, in general, overall, talking about some of the course challenges um, and use these as, as tips as well. So the altitude is probably one of the biggest challenges in the Atacama Crossing. So you're always um, above about 2,300 meters. What's that about? Is that about 6,000 feet, 5,000 feet? Um, and the highest point, it is at the very start of the race and you go downhill from there, but it's at 3,200 meters, which I believe is about 10,000 feet. Um, I'll come on a little bit, a bit in the next slide, just to give you advice on that is how to manage the altitude, but basically, Take it easy to start with. Um, the, the nights are very cold. Camp one is normally the coldest as it's the highest, um, but every night can be um, cold down to about zero Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. And the days are very hot. And most days it will get um, close to or even above 40 Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit in the heat of the day. The heat of the day in the Atacama is between about one and three, um, but it heats up after about 11 o'clock in the morning, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, it starts to heat up fast. The air is very dry uh, and the sun is very hot, partly due to the altitude and partly due to the part of the world we're, we're in is that it's a very strong sun. Um, there is minimal shade along most of the course. There is sun, um, but there isn't, that much. The terrain is very varied, which is exciting, but also is challenging. And some of that terrain is quite technical, not technical that you need any extra equipment for it. It's just difficult to run on. So running in the salt flats, there are some rocks or pebbles in the bottom of it and you can't see the bottom. Um, so you just want to be careful going through there. On the salt flats itself, it's just an uneven surface. So it's a bit like running on coral, but without the water on top. So it sometimes it breaks through or running on a plowed field um, in winter time when sometimes you'll fall through it because it's not frosted. Sometimes you'll just be plowing through, um, not deep mud, but sort of where you might sink down into it um, to, your, to the laces on your shoes, possibly to your ankles, but normally not that deep. More than 70% of the course is off-road um, of some sort of another. Hardly any of it is on an actual road, but there are some sections that are on, on dust roads, which is easier terrain for you to walk on. Um, so as much as we're generally trail runners, we don't like that, it can be a bit of a relief um, for those small sections. You will get your feet wet, but it is very dry in, in the Atacama Desert, so they generally dry fast. Um, those of you who've been on the Facebook community page, the Racing Planet community page, you see there's been some chat on there um, about what to do with, um, with crossing water. But certainly on stage two, when you're going through the slot canyons, you're in and out of the water for, for more than five kilometers, so more than three miles. So you don't want to be walking barefoot through there. Um, so I would suggest in that section for sure, you just keep your shoes on. Uh, and have a plan at the end to maybe take them off and dry your dry your socks and feet. And then the cutoff times, I've been asked quite a lot about this. Um, so to talk a bit more detail here to make sure you're clear. So there is a cutoff time at every checkpoint. And at every checkpoint, that cutoff time is a time that you, you're supposed to have left that checkpoint by. The cutoff times are based uh, on a four kilometer per hour or a 2.5 mile per hour walking speed. So they're not particularly tough to meet. You can walk the entire course and still complete it. However, it doesn't allow extra time for um, taking a break, for dealing with a blister, for um, obviously filling up your water doesn't take long, but for taking a break whilst you're doing that. So to put that into perspective, a 40 kilometer day or 25 mile stage, you would be expected to be able to complete that within 10 hours. A few tips on the course, and this is not really course specific, but it is relevant to being on the course. So number one, talking about the altitude, start slowly. If you're, su if you're suffering at all with the altitude, um, then slow down. Um, keep going, you are going downhill. Um, 
or you are lowering down in altitude after camp one. Um, so you should find that your um, breathing gets easier if you're struggling at all. 3,200 meters, 10,000 feet is about the level um, just below which altitude sickness will start. Um, but you but you will certainly feel the altitude if you haven't had a, a chance to acclimatize, acclimatize fully um, before the race. Um, so just start slowly and it should get easier after that as you go, go lower in elevation. Tread carefully on technical terrain. It'd be a shame to twist your ankle uh, on before checkpoint one of stage one, but the terrain throughout the course um, is prime for ankle twisting, so just be careful. Stay hydrated, have a plan of drinking and electrolytes uh, and stick to it um, and make sure that you, even if you don't feel like, or even if it's cooler in the morning, make sure that you are drinking consistent, consistently um, throughout the, the stage. And always leave a checkpoint with 1.5 liters of water we require this and we will be checking as you go through, um, but if you think you're trying to hide it, don't. Um, even if you don't need it, it's not that much extra weight. And if you do need it, you'll be grateful for it. Um, eat consistently from, from the beginning. Don't wait until you're hungry after running 30 kilometers and suddenly you're hungry because it's very hard to catch up after that. Prepare for the climate. And to say a bit more, some examples on that. So. In the morning when you start, it will be cold, but still put sunscreen on or be prepared to stop as soon as the sun comes out um, because rest assured, even if we're lucky and we have a few cloudy days, the sun will be strong. And if you've got any skin um, that's not underneath, a, uh, underneath clothing, then you need to have sunscreen on it. Um, and then just a reminder to everyone, that there isn't much shade, but when there is shade or, or when you're at a checkpoint, it's at least five degrees cooler in the shade. So if you're feeling very hot, please take some time just to sit down. You, you've got a cross between the cutoff time and keeping yourself, help, yourself healthy, but most of you won't be close to the cutoff time. So take those few minutes to rest in the shade to give yourself a chance to cool down. A couple of key points about camp. So camp will be set up for you uh, each day. So when you um, arrive at camp, both on Saturday afternoon and then every day after that, when you've completed um, each stage of the race, camp will be set up and the shared tents will be set up for you. Those in single tents, um, we will endeavor to help put those up, but depending on the time available and how fast you are and how things are going, you need to be prepared to be putting those up and taking those down yourself. Hot water for preparing meals and preparing hot drinks will be available from 5.30 a.m. each morning and from around 2 p.m. until 8 or 9 p.m. in the evening um, at the next camp. Cold water has been provided in 20 liter containers. So don't expect to use um, one use bottles for eating your food or for, for carrying any water. You'll be filling up your own containers. Toilets at camp will be provided and must be used. Um, there's no showers at camp and washing is not allowed in terms of having a full wash and shower with the drinking water. There's fires each evening and each morning. Um, which helps keep you warm or warm you up and, and create the atmosphere and, and be a place to, um, to be, be around there with, with your, the other races. And then the cyber tent is open from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. most days. Equipment. I'm not gonna to talk too much about this because I hope by now you've checked everything, but as a summary, there's 37 mandatory items uh, and that's not by individual. So, for example, socks is a mandatory item and there's three pairs. That counts as one, one item. So please take this chance to go through the equipment list in detail uh, and make sure that you have everything in the right quantity and that meets the requirement. In addition to those 37 items is a drop bag, which we are allowing and we will carry for you each day, which is only for an extra sleeping bag or a blanket. Um, and your rapid COVID tests. It must all fit inside a 35 litre dry bag maximum, uh, and you will be given it each evening at camp so that you every evening you will have the opportunity to have your extra sleeping bag. 
And then for those who are bringing their own tents uh, for single tents, then you also bring that um, either together in your with your sleeping bag or as a separate uh, in a separate bag. Some key tips without going through in detail, but I'm sure you'll have some questions on some items at the end. Make sure your shoes are suitable to the terrain. Um, I hope that you've already looked at this as we are now three weeks away. Gators, I've seen some questions on it recently. They are highly recommended because there is a lot of sand and a lot of dust and dirt that goes in. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can ask in the questions. Um, a sleeping bag is an optional item, but it's highly recommended because it does get cold at night and the ground can be rocky at some of the campsites. A sleeping bag must be carried and must be rated down to zero Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. Even though we're also carrying an extra sleeping bag for you, you still need to carry a sleeping bag with this rating. Um, you must have the capacity to carry 2.5 litres of water. 1.5 litres of it will be easily accessible. As you can see in this photo is an example of how majority of races do it, is they'll have the um, bottles on their front, um, on the front of their backpacks with straws coming out. So it's easy to, to access to fill up at a checkpoint, also easy to access to drink so that you're encouraged to drink. Um, sun cream, for example, is a minimum amount on the equipment list an item like that and look at the others as well to see whether you think you want to bring more. That's one of those items where I'd consider extra, especially if you're fair skinned. Um, and then in your equipment, consider coverage, coverage from the sun um, as well as um, the comfort in running. Um, because the sun is so strong, you might want to consider short sleeves or make sure that some you, it's required, but make sure that your coverage of the back of your neck um, it, is is tried and tested uh, and, and looks or seems like it would work. So coming to the end of me talking, but here there's some, some questions that I get asked quite a lot or have been asked recently that I'm gonna hopefully prompt some of your questions to come up. So are there any streams or lakes near camps where people can wash? So in the Atacama Crossing, there aren't. There are streams and, and um, pools, not swimming pools, but um, uh, well, they watering holes um, along the course. And you can use those to wash, but that will any time spent there will count in your overall time of the race. Um, but there aren't any near any of the campsites. Do I get hot water on the course? So no, hot water is only available at camp between the hours I've mentioned already, except on the long march where there'll be one overnight checkpoint, which is around the halfway mark, uh, where there will be hot water available and sleeping tents where you can have some extra rest and a hot meal. How do cutoff times work on the long march? So they work exactly the same as on the other stages, except that at the overnight checkpoint, we allow an extra three hours or so uh, so if you're walking at that same pace that you have been throughout the um, the race, you you should arrive there um, three hours before the time that the cutoff time that is required for you to leave, which allows you to have an extra three hours rest. During any time that you rest on the long march or any other stage until you reach the final camp, that is all included in your overall uh, timing. How much should my pack weigh? Um, so. I generally say try not to go over 10 kilos and maybe someone can put in the chat what that is in pounds. My pounds kilos conversion is, is terrible. Um, you generally want to be trying to get it to eight to 10 um, kilos, not go over 12. And the lightest pack will probably be around six kilos. Um, but to be at six kilos, you're most likely going to be hungry or cold at some point. So it is possible. Uh, below that is very unusual, um, but that gives you an idea on the kind of weights you're looking at. So between eight to 10 kilos. Um, can I use water for washing? No, is the quick answer. We will have foot basins at the medical tent where you can use a little bit of water in the bottom of them just to keep your uh, feet clean because um, they are going to be key to you finishing. Um, and you can use a little bit of water to obviously to wash your um, teeth and rinse out your, your bowl, but not for a full-on wash. Is there mobile phone reception on the course? There isn't very much, but there is some. 
However, using your phone for anything other than emergency is not allowed. We're trying to make this part of a digital detox, a way to get away from everyday life. If you are seen using your phone um, for messaging or watching videos or anything other than um, taking, a, taking pictures or for music or for an emergency, then there will be a time penalty. However, we will give you an emergency number so you can carry a phone um, if you want to. And if you were in a situation where you needed help on the course uh, and there was cell reception, then you can call that phone number. I'll also stress on that point, don't just rely on that number being available because it relies on you having um, cell reception. Where those phones are having cell reception, we will give you two and one will be a satellite phone, which will always be in reception. But even then, it can be um, it, it can it can come and go. Um, so think more about yourself before just relying on I'm not feeling well, but I'll keep going because I can call for help if I need to. Um, on that note, there is the cyber tent. I've sent a brief message on it and I'll send more where you can receive messages that have been sent to you through the website. Um, and if you've bought a cyber tent package, you can also send short messages back home or write blogs. Um, so you have a little bit of contact with the outside world, um, but primarily you're trying to keep away from all of the news in the world. Who doesn't want to stay away from what's going on in the news these days? Do I have to carry all my rubbish or trash? Um, you have to carry it as far as the rubbish bins that we provided. There are rubbish bins at checkpoint and there are rubbish bins at camp and you can put your trash uh, in there. Um, do not leave it on the course, do not leave it in your tent, um, but you don't have to carry it for the entire race. What time is sunrise or sunset? So sunrise is around 7.30 and sunset is around 7.30 p.m. So generally it starts to get light around seven, a little bit before. Um, but the sunrise officially 7.30 and in the evening, the same thing. So it's it's pretty dark by 8 p.m. I'm going to send this to you afterwards, um, but there's two key bits of information that I would suggest that you look at after this um, call, which you might not have done already. One is a race report that was written by um, a racer from 2019 in the Atacama Crossing, where she describes each stage. Um, it was her first time doing one of our races uh, and she finished on the podium, um, but it gives you an idea of the challenges and it's a very, very well written um, race report to give you information about what to expect. And then the second is the Zoom information sec uh, session about the course, which is about an hour long recording where it has examples like I showed you of the elevation chart with some photos um, and a bit more detail about the course. So on that note, I've been talking for a long time. I'm gonna come back to you and see if you have any um, questions. If you do, you can unmute yourself um, and, and ask me. Uh, yeah, hi, a very quick question to clarify about the mobile phones. Um, so it's okay to use them for taking pictures, right? Yes. Okay. It's okay to use them for taking pictures, but not for anything where you're accessing the internet. Yeah, yeah, or... no, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, Sam. John here. Hi, John. Hi, John. Around the campsites. No, two questions, really to do with the ground. In the tents, is there a floor in the tents or are we straight on the dirt? And around the campsites, is it rocky, sharp rocks? Or, you know, is it, I'm just thinking about the flip flops, is it gonna tear them up? So to answer your first question, it's a closed tent and it has a flooring attached to it. The flooring is waterproof, um, a plastic, but has no other, doesn't give you any insulation, but you're not on the dirt. Um, and quickly on that note, so it means that it's difficult to, the dirt doesn't get in, but if it does get in, it's difficult to get out. We will sweep them out, but we'll also have um, a dustpan and brush around camp that you can sweep out extra from your tent if, if it blows in. Um, in terms of what the ground is like, it depends from camp to camp, but most of them are quite rocky, not super sharp rocks. Flip-flops would be okay on most parts. I would recommend flip-flops over say hotel slippers. 
um, which people have started to bring for camp shoes because they they don't provide any protection against rocks. Does that answer that question? It does indeed. Thanks, Sam. Another question about patches on waterproof jackets. Is that a requirement? It is a requirement. Um, patches need to go on all the mandatory tops. I know some people get um, worried about putting them on. We've never had any problems with the patches not making the tops waterproof, but I appreciate maybe if you take them off, they might not. Um, you can't wear armbands because we find that people don't wear them after the first day or first couple of days when they're tired. There are things you can do. So on the jackets, because they're not worn so much, you can use um, fabric glue to stick them on. And you could just um, stitch them loosely in the corner, in, in each of the corners rather than all the way across. Um, but yes, they are required to be there. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Sure. What's the shopping, what's the local shop like? I mean, if we do get a lot of our goods, our foods confiscated coming into the country through customs, you know, are we going to be able to replace some items? On how, good, how good is the local shopping? So in San Pedro itself, you will not find much of any freeze dried food, specific electrolytes, um, uh, protein powders, uh, anything like that. Um, you will find nuts, crisps, noodles, um, bread, cheese, like sim think, think of like a, a village or a small town um, supermarket or, or shop in, in honey, most parts do they of the have world. Honey? Have they got honey, Sam? Say that again, honey, did you say? Honey, yeah, I'm not calling you honey. <laughs> have they got, do they sell honey? Is that a common Yeah, thing? I'm pretty sure they sell honey, peanut butter. I, I'm I'm just trying to, I'm not sure I've ever bought honey there, but I want to say that I'm pretty sure that they have honey in the in the supermarkets there. Jam. Okay, thank you. Sam, Sam, I, I, I just want to mention that actually I have seen honey in the San, Santiago airport, which actually has quite quite a few things now as well. Yeah, they, and that's a, that's a good point. The other point on that is that in Kalama, um, they have everything like that you would expect. Still not specific freeze dried meals, um, but they have everything you'd see in a big normal supermarket at home. So as a worst case, it's a trip into Kalama. Um, but as I said, we've not had problems with, with most freeze dried food or anything that's processed. It's mainly just fresh food that some people have problems with. Sam? Yeah. This is Dave. Um, are we required to wear the patches um, all the time in the camp? Um, for example, if I bring a puffy, uh, do I need to have that if I'm uh, just wearing it around the camp? So for the mandatory gear, yes. So the mandatory gear and anything that's going to be worn on the outside uh, when anybody's around at, um, at camp or on the course. So it's a running top, it's a warm top, it's a waterproof um, top, and they are they have to have patches on them. Um, if there's if you're bringing something to wear inside the tent, which which is never going to be seen by anyone, that doesn't have to have patches on it. Um, but I would suggest that anything you do bring, you keep it versatile for wearing in the tent, on the course, around camp. So I would just say, other than your waterproof poncho every top that you have should have the patches on them. Thank you. I have a question for, for, the, for the dry bag. We, yeah. we need to have a dry bag also for our backpack. So you need to bring two dry bags with you. One is for your backpack that the idea is that you have it inside your backpack uh, and then you have all your equipment or at least all of the equipment that you don't want to ever get wet inside that dry bag. Um, you saw the photo from the slot canyons where you could go up to your waist uh, and some people have tripped and, and fallen in. It's not dangerous but you could get wet and also to protect it from sweat when you're running. So you need one dry bag for that and then one dry bag to put your um, extra sleeping bag in uh, that you give to us to carry each day. 
It's unlikely to rain, but all of those bags will be put into one um, outside trailer or at the outside back of a car. Um, and there's a chance that they get dusty or wet or whatever along the way. So it's better to protect that. So yes, two dry bags, one that you carry to line your backpack and one that you put your extra sleeping bag in um, to, uh, that we will carry each day. But my uh, back uh, has only 20 liters. You can bring a slightly smaller dry bag if your backpack is very small, but make sure it's bigger than 20 liters because you still need to be able to roll it down enough at the top. Okay. I, I would suggest you still keep it at 30. I think um, we put 30 or 35 on there. I suggest you still keep it at that to make sure it can fit everything inside. Um, but if you go a little bit smaller, it, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Hi, Sam. There quickly as well, if that's okay. Yes. In in relation to uh, the uh, check, the the equipment check on in in the in the hotel before we go go into the desert, um, how how extreme is it? In, in sense of obviously, you want to pack your food and make sure everything in in your bag is 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 pretty much you know nicely nicely organized. I mean. To what level, like if, if we have a, a spreadsheet with our, our calorie count and our, our day snacks, et cetera, et cetera, will that suffice? Or, do you know, at, at what level do we have to go into us, do you know? Okay. First thing, we will check every single piece of equipment that you have, um, and it must meet the requirements then. Second thing is regarding repackaging of food and electrolytes and powders, it's okay for you to repackage it. Uh, you need to be able to explain in case one of the um, team who's checking your food has a question on it. We're pretty good at knowing what's what um, in terms of what sizing and what type of food has how many calories. Um, and we also recommend that in most cases you go over the minimum um, of 2,400 calories. You actually have a little bit more than that. Uh, that's an absolute minimum. So that should cover it. But if you've either got a spreadsheet or you've got it written on, or you can able to answer any questions that come your way, that's fine for check-in. Another one for me, if I may. Um, of course. Recommended to bring any local uh, currency cash with you, or not really. It's the same as if you're going on holiday to any place. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest you have some cash on you. Um, right, but general credit cards work. Yes, and general credit cards can work, yeah. So it's not essential, but it's no harm in having a little bit. And if you're buying one bottle of water from a small supermarket, they're not going to be that happy if you produce a credit card, um, although they'll probably accept it. Um, so it's good to have a little bit of, little bit of cash. Uh, Mary, was there anything else on the chat that's worth bringing up to everybody's attention here? Uh, there were just some questions about if the uh, sleeping bag and uh, if the sleeping bag or extra blanket is mandatory. And uh, I said, no, no, it's not, but it is highly recommended uh, to bring that. And then just some questions about um, how, how many people in the tent. I said about four to six people in each tent. It's going to be four in, in most of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sam, if um, I may have a question. Yeah. Uh, Mary, oh, sorry, sorry, Mary, for interrupting. I thought you were finished. Mary, go ahead. No, no, no. I think, I think if you finish, Mary. Uh, yeah, I, I am finished. Yeah, so uh, just a quick question when we're in camp. Uh, do we have any reception so we can check email, social networks, or no reception at all? First of all, it's not allowed. You're, okay. you're trying to get away from yes. the world. So the immediate answer is no. Okay. Um, and, and in general, the reception is not great anyway. If I see you using your phone, you will get a warning and then a time penalty other than for, for taking pictures. But there okay. is the cyber tent where if you tell your friends where to send messages to, which is through the website on the results page, and I will send a, a link to all of the ways that they can they can see your results, your photos, your videos, they can send you messages that you can forward on before the race. Then you can check in their messages that are sent to you. 
Okay, Use well, this as an opportunity not to have to go near social media for a week. <laughs> ah, okay, so in case of any emergency from the family or friends and they need to send me a message, we go through that channel, right? So there's an email address. Um, it's emergency at racingtheplanet.com. Okay. That if they have something that comes up, they can email that. There is someone off-site that is checking that, both the chilly time and also in Hong Kong time, but actually that's the opposite. So more or less 24 hours a day. So if something comes through, we will be able to get a message to you. Okay, any other questions? Is everyone clear on the entry requirements into, into Chile? As I said, if you've got your vaccination certificates, you're aware of the the affidavit, I know I say it in a very strange way, um, in case somebody asks for it. And it seems that worst case scenario, if, any, if they don't like anything, they'll make you do a PCR test. And, and if it's negative, they'll let you through everything. But I think it's going to be quite straightforward getting into Chile. Oh, uh, Sam. Yeah. Sam. Yeah. Could I just say before you final uh, finish it that... Um, I mean, I must say, so I've, I've been going to Chile for about 20, uh, 20 years now, and it is, uh, it is a spectacular country, um, especially in the north. And I think the village of San Pedro has to be probably my most favorite village in, in the entire world. So you are, you are just going to have a fabulous race. I am very much looking forward to meeting you all and being back in San Pedro. Um, before I come on to the final checklist, so there's a few people on the call who have done the race before. We actually have about 13% of the field are coming back to Atacama for the second or even more time. Have any of you guys got anything you want to add in terms of things that tips for, for those coming for the first time? Uh, blisters. <laughs> blisters were really bad. Yeah, blisters were really bad. They were okay on the first day. Um, the, from the second day onwards, they were really, really bad. The doctors were really good. The medical team were fantastic. They helped. But um, I, I've been testing different kinds of socks and shoes and creams and gels um, during this training you know, period because they, um, if you get bad blisters, then you're really quite crippled and you can't run. So that, that was one thing. And that, camp one was very, very cold. And then they were, um, well, that was the, the coldest. And I, I, I did notice a, um, a temperature change, but camp one was super cold. And looking forward to meeting everyone. And it's a great point, Nick. I mean, it's, it's the same for all races, but Atacama definitely uh, takes its toll on your feet. The main reason that people don't finish the race is blisters, altitude, dehydration, and, and then just not being mentally prepared for what's, for what's uh, ahead of them. So 250 kilometers day after day after day for seven days. Um, so if you can get over those, those um, barriers, then you're in good shape. And even though Nick had horrendous uh, blisters after day one, he still managed to finish the race, but probably was less enjoyable than, than it might have been without any blisters. And yes, camp one is very cold, but um, you have an extra sleeping bag that we're carrying for you this time. Um, so hopefully that will, will help. Sorry, Sam, someone asked a question. Um, what is the best local uh, SIM card to get? Um, it is Movi uh, Movistar. Movi Movistar. Uh, sorry, the Movistar or Intel, E-N-T-E-L. Okay. And you can buy those in San Pedro and the top ups for them, uh, but you can also buy them if you've got a layover in Santiago airport, it may be worth looking to see if you can get one there just to save time. Um, but yes, you can buy those in San Pedro. And then Sam, the, the other question that I know the, the rules recently changed for entering Chile is if someone did test positive uh, with a PCR test, if in, in the Santiago airport, what um, do they do? So they 
the rules simply say that they would have to go into quarantine. So if you were chosen by the government when you come through immigration to be tested and you did te test positive, it could either be a PCR test or a rapid test that they ask you to do. And if you did test positive, then you do have to go into, um, into quarantine. I believe you can choose where you go with that, um, but you would need to pay for it, which is why another reason why it's important to have the insurance. So the key on that is just try to stay COVID free. Again, minimize big gatherings, wear your mask when you're traveling. Um, if you're worried before you leave your own country that you might be um, uh, have come into contact with it, then take a test before you leave. And it's not that's not an exciting answer to the question, but it is uh, unfortunately that is the the rules in Chile. Um, okay, so final checklist for you to uh, take away from here: check all your equipment, probably again against the equipment list. Um, purchase or or make sure that you've got the rapid COVID test to bring with you. Secure your patches on all the tops. Check your documents and print them out so you have them easily accessible for when you arrive in Chile. And that's primarily your vaccination certificate, your mobility pass if you have it, uh, and your insurance. Um, keep to your training or tapering plan as you have it for now. Watch or read the recommended info. And I said the two, two items specifically, but obviously also equipment lists and blogs and um, photos, etc. But two things was the race report by a racer from 2019 and the Zoom uh, info session recording about the course. And I will send you the links to those. Um, be careful to avoid contact with COVID-19 before you leave your country and whilst you're traveling. Travel with a mask um, wherever you can at airports, on planes to reduce the risk of any infection. And you get yourself to San Pedro de Atacama on Friday, the 23rd of September. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining me. I hope you've uh, in, uh, found it useful. And if you have other questions, of course, you can email me. Uh, this will go up onto YouTube. I'll send you a link to it so you can listen to it again if you want to. And uh, I look forward to meeting you all soon.